Uh, okay, so first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation and it's great to be here today. Um, so as for me, I'm going to present to you data on the dynamics of face and social facial signal processing uh, and what we can obtain from MAKE uh, on this topic. So first of all, uh, I don't know how many of you here, here is working on faces, but I've been working on faces for long because faces are very rich stimuli that convey a lot of information that are crucial in our uh, interpersonal interaction. So it con they convey information about the identity of others, about social categories, you know, gender, age, things like that but also more dynamic information about the direction of attention, the object of interest in the environment, what we looked at, and also the emotions uh, felt by others, how we feel. And in so doing, they give us invaluable information about the intention, the mental states of others, and they are essential component of person perception. Um, so in this talk, I will focus on the study we've done with regard to, um, I'm gonna try to give you this because I think it will end up to be on the floor, um, on gaze perception and facial expression uh, perception. So uh, as for gaze, why are we interested in gaze? It's because it seems that in human, uh, the eyes have evolved to uh, become really a signal to others. It's not only the channels through which you gather information on the environment, but with the light, you know, with the shape of our eyes and the large exposed white sclera in our eyes, our eyes are signals to others. It's the most, the eyes of the, f the eyes in the face is the first and most explored region and it has been known for long. And uh, maybe this is one of the reasons why the eyes have become a crucial cue to the direction of others' attention in the surrounding space. And in doing so, uh, as I said, it allows inference of intention, mental states of object of interest in the environment and it gives rise to phenomenon uh, such as attention orienting, which is um, one of the elementary components of joint attention, uh, and it's a building blo block of uh, mentalizing ability. And also, gaze is crucial uh, in interpersonal synchronization, you know, our ability to synchronize and exchange uh, with others. Uh, on the other hand, uh, facial expressions of emotions have also greatly evolved in humans. Uh, we have a very mobile face, and it's a nude face for most part. And uh, so this is why we have developed a variety. The richness of human facial expression is maybe unique to humans. And of course, emotions uh, have a crucial adaptive value and we share this with uh, all those, uh, the other animals. Uh, but maybe one uh, slightly uh, specific thing is that the, the emotion expression has also again become uh, almost primarily a communicative signal among uh, human people and it's one of the primary uh, signals through which we communicate with others. Uh, plus this information, they are integrated together and the integration of gaze and emotional expression is of course crucial to our ability uh, to interpret the behavior of others. This is not only because the eyes is maybe the most expressive part of face, it's also because the, the meaning, the signification of emotion uh, can be changed by the gaze direction of the person we see. So uh, over the last years, uh, we have run a series of studies to try to, s to examine the early neural coding of gaze direction and social attention, the integration of gaze and emotion cues from face, how fast is our brain able to do that, and what are the brain regions involved. And also we have examined the impact of social cues, particularly of gaze, uh, on the processing of surrounding objects. And for this, we have used uh, MEG and also EEG, in fact. So um, the early neural coding of gaze direction and social attention. Um, I have to say that, in fact, uh, it's been known for long that the N170 and the M170, which are uh, very really the typical component uh, that are usually recorded in response to faces. From the very first study on these components, it's been shown that these components are sensitive to eyes and also, in fact, to a uh, gaze direction. And this is one of the early study we did um, on the perception of, of gaze movement uh, with EEG, in fact, where we showed that, you know, a tiny movement of gaze that could yield either to gaze contact or to averted gaze would elicit uh, very clearly different uh, N170 response to those face. Now, at some point, uh, we wanted to move on 
from gays to social attention and we wanted to uh, examine whether uh, there is an early encoding of social attention scenarios uh, during social scene perception. Why did we want to study that? It's because in classical experiment, when you see faces with direct and averted gaze, social attention direction is confounded with gaze direction. And we know there are cells in the temporal cortex that cut for gaze direction. But social attention uh, is something when you are in a third person perspective and you observe a social scene, you can also decode social attention from the way people look at each other, establishing sometimes mutual attention, or from the way they can look aside, for example. And in this case, it's not confounded with uh, the self-involvement, you know, having someone looking at you versus you looking away. So this is why we took uh, this perspective on social attention perception. And for this, we use those avatar faces that were, in fact, uh, made by Ina Pius. And this face uh, change the gaze direction after looking downward, either to look to each other or uh, to look together sideways. And uh, one thing it means that you have an initial baseline period during which there is a phase. Now the, the you know the onset of gaze and the mutual the social attention scenario is not confounded with the onset of faces on screen. The, the faces are there for a while, and at some point in time, they move their gaze. And we're going to be interested in the response, the brain response to these tiny brain changes. The, the subject is fixating here and doing a simple uh, task of, sometime here it becomes blue. So they have to detect the, the blue dot in the central part of the screen and, and refrain to moving their eyes. So when you have a design like that, what I personally find quite fascinating is the fact that the change that it represents in the picture, just this tiny change in the picture, picture does elicit a very, very clear event-related uh, response, a magnetic field response here, that you see in the shape of typical shape of the M170 to the uh, here uh, gaze movement of the faces. And the interesting thing is that in every case, this is a movement of gaze that makes the gaze lateral in lateral position. There is never a direct gaze in this experiment, but still you can see a modification. So just before 200 milliseconds, there is a modification of the activity as a function of whether it is a mutual attention scenario that is et established or a group deviated attention that is established uh, following the gaze movement. And this culminates over uh, posterior parietal uh, temporal sensors. So what this study reveals is that there is an early neural coding of social attention scenario and it emphasized the importance of gaze as a social signal of social attention. But in fact, in this experiment, we wanted to go further uh, to study the integration of this gaze information with emotion cue for faces. Uh, the reason for this is that, you know, we have a lot of information now about the whereabouts of emotion coding and more generally face coding. There is a huge network of brain regions that are involved. Um, we know many of them, but uh, what is much well, less well known is the timing of the integration uh, between different types of information on face and particularly different types of dynamic information. And some people, uh, the most classical view, I would say, is that there is a late phase of integration that would involve more the extended system, for example, involving um, regions such as the amygdala. Or there could also be some more uh, earlier integration in more posterior part of the brain that are uh, involved in the core uh, system for phase analysis. So to answer this question, we had our design. And in fact, I didn't show you the entire movie. So after the scenario was established, there was a dynamic emotion with the growing and the waning of the emotion over three seconds. One second of growing and uh, two seconds of waning. So we have a two by two by factorial design where you have a social context that is established with the face looking, uh, they look mutually t toward each other or they look to the side. And after a second, there is the emotion that that's comes in. And so now we're going to look at the activity elicited by the emotion in those differential contexts, knowing that the gaze here doesn't change at all. So what we obtain, uh, to make the long story short, is the following. 
we obtain modulation over two parts of our, our sensors with a dissociation in the effect we obtain over the most posterior sensors versus the most anterior sensors. Over the posterior sensors, we had initially only a main effect of emotion, you know, like that is it, the activity was differentiated as a function of whether the face would display an angry emotion versus a happy emotion. And later on, you could see an interaction between gaze and emotion, with basically usually it's the angry faces in the context of mutual attention that tends to depart from the other condition. Uh, now, in a quite uh, different way, you, the, the, the response you obtain on, on more anterior sensor, in the right anterior temporal sensors here, <coughs> frontal temporal sensors, is a response that from early on is reflecting an interaction between emotion and social attention. That is the encoding here that is done of the emotion depends on the social attention scenario under which the emotion arises with a clearly differentiated response to the mutual angry scenario that can be uh, maybe seen as the most relevant uh, scenario to the subject. So what this tends to show is that not only you have a specially distributed network of regions that are activated when you see faces, but there seem to be parallel functional routes uh, that process of face with some routes over which there is initial separation of the inform segregation of the information, separable processing of emotion and gaze information, and later on integration of those information. And over other part of the uh, system, you have early integration uh, of the information uh, coming from the faces. So now, uh, just uh, we tried also in some in, in of our experiment to uh, focus, as Denis mentioned, on the role of the amygdala in the encoding of information for faces, from faces and especially in the encoding of these emotion and gaze information. So for this, we use the advanced model for source localization uh, in the amygdala that has been developed uh, by Denise with uh, Johan Atal. Uh, so it uses, as he said, segmentation of the medial temporal lobe structure and here we use a grid of, of triples uh, that are distributed over the amygdala volume. And with this, we uh, look at the response of the brain during the perception of fearful and neutral faces with direct and averted gaze. Simple task. We reconstruct the activity in the amygdala. And what we find is that there is, you as you can see, there is an early rising of the activity from about 80 milliseconds and a prominent peak here around 140 milliseconds, uh, then followed by more sustained activity, which in fact reflect uh, peaks of activities that vary in latency from one subject to the other, because here it's the grad average of 15 subjects. And there is a clear modulation of the early activity by the emotional expression of the face, so uh, with greater response as would be expected to the fearful as compared to the um, neutral faces. And it's only later on in this design that we see an effect of gaze. We have a main effect of gaze, but in fact that is qualified by an interaction with both uh, hemisphere and emotion, so that in fact uh, the effect is clearly seen in the right hemisphere with greater response to direct than averted gaze uh, especially for the fearful faces. Uh, on top of that, the overall uh, activity level of the amygdala uh, correlates with the uh, anxiety level of the subject as measured by the Spielberger inventory tests. So uh, what this result showed is something that has, was claimed by uh, Adolf uh, quite a while ago, in fact, uh, but was never empirically uh, demonstrated in human, is that uh, in Mindala, in fact, is involved in multiple stages of face processing. So it's not only that you may have different <coughs> regions of the amygdala, again, processing, uh, encoding gaze and emotion. This is something that has been shown in monkeys. But it's also that at different point in time, the amygdala may be, in fact, uh, encoding different types of information. So now, uh, on a slightly different topic, you know, the, the, the interest with face is not only the way our brain process 
face and it seems that our brain has evolved and it's quite expert and biased toward perceiving face and perceiving information from face but it's also the fact that in fact the presence of others uh, does modify the way we perceive our uh, environment and uh, one classical effect in this domain is the effect of gaze orienting you know the fact that if I see a face gazing sideways I will be faster at detecting a target that appears on the looked at side uh, as compared to my uh, speed at detecting a target uh, appearing at the opposite side of the screen. So uh, with Fanny, in fact, uh, we had this experiment where we wanted to look at, okay, we know nowadays that attention can modulate activity, visual activity in the very early time range, but so we wanted to test whether uh, the kind of um, modulation of activity in relation to attention cueing would occur very early when the gaze cue were delivered by fearful face as compared to happy faces. So we had the face as Denny showed, they were neutral, they could turn ha fearful or happy and they would gaze to the right or to the left and then there was a simple target uh, that would appear on the looked at side or on the opposite side. And what we found is that in the case of the fearful faces only, there was a very early validity effect, that is a difference of the MEG response to the valid versus invalid cues. And uh, this validity effect was localized to the uh, superior parietal lobal and the lateral occipital cortex uh, in the left hemisphere, which uh, may be the uh, electrophysiological marker of an early orienting of attention uh, in response to uh, fearful gaze. Now, uh, we wanted to go a step further because it's been recently shown that gaze can have an impact on the affective evaluation of the surrounding world. In brief, you tend to like more the objects that are looked at by others than the objects that are not looked at by others. So this effect has now been uh, demonstrated by several groups and we've uh, extended it. So the idea of the experiment is simple. First you do a classical a uh, gaze queuing paradigm where you have the face, it turns its gaze and then it's, there is an item that appears either on the looked at side or on the opposite side. And uh, okay, so you ask the usual speeded, for example, categorization. Is this a letter or uh, a non-alphabetic character? And then after a few blocks, you show again these items and you ask the people how much they like them. And the manipulation you do without telling the subject is that, for example, the red W will always appear on the looked at side, whereas the blue W will always appear on the non-looked at side. And of course, uh, we have a green T, a yellow T, and blue uh, M, and red M, and we counterbalance everything, but there is always, for each letter, one color will be on the valid side, the other on the invalid side, so that we can uh, look at whether uh, the object looked at are liked more or less than the object not looked at. What we find is the following, classical queuing effect, you're faster to respond to the item that appear on the valid side, and you like more the valid item as compared to the invalid item. That is, you are like more the object, the items, here it was purely abstract uh, alphanumerical character that appear on the looked at side as compared to the non-looked at side. And this is just a, a break out of the data according to the type of item. We had the same item as in, as in the original uh, experiment by Baylis and only for garage item we didn't manage to reproduce the effect he had shown and we had the uh, abstract letters and symbols. Now, what we've added to that is that we've tried to reproduce this experiment showing now the face, the initial gaze contact, because it's important to have this uh, intentional communicative stance in the first place, then followed by uh, pointing hands, and we wanted to see whether we would get the same effect. And quite uh, originally, what you find is you find a very marked, even more marked than with gaze, you find a clearly very marked orienting effect of attention, but no trace of liking. The, the, the liking is non-significant and we broke through according to the different type of item, the liking doesn't reach significant. So this suggests that gaze may have a special uh, status as a social communication referential uh, cue. 
So then in the next step, we wanted to try to uh, follow the uh, magnetic trace, the neuromagnetic response to the target during the encoding phase. That is, while you are encoding uh, this target in the gaze queuing task, what are the, the, the response to the attention orienting and what are the response to the affective value of the items? And for this, we looked at the response to the target during this phase of categorization uh, while recording MEG. Okay, so the result we obtained well, showed the clear, usual uh, lateralization of the brain response. So for left target, you have early right lateralized activity and for right target, early left lateralized activity. And uh, we have then uh, the uh, unfolding in time of activity. And I will just show you here the source reconstruction. So according to what we've seen at the surface, uh, you find more right lateralized a posterior activity for left target, left lateralized for right target. And then these activities they unfold in time. As you see, they tend to spread toward the temporal regions and also toward the parietal regions. Uh, for the spreading over the temporal regions, you see that around 400 milliseconds, the activities, they become more bilateral, especially in the right uh, superior temporal sulcus regions. And uh, for the uh, parietal regions, you see that there is some left lateralization of the activation for both uh, target side. And this is due to the fact, you know, this is the motor response, basically, the subject that we're detecting the target with the right hand. So what do we find then in this today? Uh, as for the attention orienting effect, what we find is that uh, is modulation of activity in the posterior occipital and parietal regions according to uh, the, uh, that are lateralized according to the side of the target. In fact, did I make a mistake? Left target? Yes, I think I made a mistake. This is a left, ta left target, so right effect, and right, uh, and right target shows left effect. Sorry, it's me uh, having written things too fast. So uh, what we find in this case, we find some early effects. So the effect, they start before um, uh, 100 milliseconds, around 90 milliseconds in the right hemisphere. And overall, they tend to be uh, more distributed and start earlier in the right hemisphere. Uh, the effect in the left hemisphere are slightly less marked, and they are in much more uh, superior parietal regions. Uh, but OK, uh, they still uh, uh, reach significant uh, for mainly the control lateral target and, and follow the kind of, of pattern that would be expected. Now for the liking. Uh, the problem we have faced in this experiment is that we didn't manage to replicate uh, the liking effect we had obtained, uh, the modulation of the liking according to the gaze direction you know, in this experiment. And uh, in fact, we think there may be several reasons to that. And uh, we may discuss that after, if you want. Um, so what we decided is OK to split the item, uh, doing a, me a median split uh, according to how much they were liked afterwards, high liked versus low liked items. And we wanted to see whether in the encoding phase, we could see some activities that would be predictive that would uh, correlate with how much of the, effect the, the object were liked uh, later on. And what we found is that there is indeed modulation in posterior uh, temporal regions starting around 100 milliseconds in the posterior superior temporal sulcus region and then spreading to the occipital regions and to more uh, posterior parietal regions here where you see higher activity for the light item as uh, compared to the uh, item that are light less. So this suggests that there is some enhanced activity for uh, uh, eye relative to low light target in the right posterior lateral temporal parietal regions uh, that are predictive, yes, of how much you like the, uh, the, the object. Now, whether this is a general effect, that is, in any design, we would find that these kind of regions you know, encode something that has to do with the hedonic value of the object or whether these activity, you know, the kind of posterior temporal, uh, lateral temporal uh, location is related to our design because these targets were encoded in the context of an attention orienting task and a gaze queuing task um, is something to be tested in the future. So uh, as a conclusion, what uh, this uh, 
or the set of studies showed is that gaze has an important aspect impact on the processing of surrounding objects. It modula modulates this processing in relation with attention orienting effect. Uh, the liking of minimally uh, valence objects like letters, alphanumeric characters uh, seems to be uh, predicted by activity in right posterior temporal region at least in the context of our gaze queuing task. And uh, this may be uh, um, uh, an index of uh, task dependent neural underpinning of hedonic value because usually this kind of region has not been reported in former studies of, uh, of uh, hedonic value of objects. So uh, as a general con conclusion, uh, faces are highly throughout this experiment. We show that faces are highly relevant stimuli that convey a wealth of social signals and that this social signal they are extracted and integrated very rapidly by the human brain even involving distributed regions of the visual and emotional brain and uh, these uh, activation may participate to the impact uh, of gaze and emotion on the processing of the surrounding world. And with this I will conclude uh, with my thanks to the collaborators of the studies that I've showed today, uh, of course all the staff of the MEG EEG Centre, Rosé Louis, uh, Uloa Fulgeri and uh, Thibaut Dumas who were a PhD student uh, in my lab and in fact I added the result of your experiment yesterday so you were not there but Fanny should be added in this list. Laurence Conti who was uh, my first PhD student and, and uh, did run uh, with me the, the initial study on gaze and Heine Apius uh, who was a collaborator on the study of dynamic uh, gaze and emotion and I thank you for your attention. Here we had also the fusiform. I don't know whether I have the fusiform slides somewhere <coughs> around here. Yeah. <coughs> so we clearly had uh, it. Uh, we clearly had very uh, you know uh, activity in the both the lateral occipital regions X and the fusiform. You see, mm -hmm. uh, with a right lateralization. And what we found is uh, you find the same first prominent peak. The activity after is much less sustained. And you also find, yes, uh, modulation by uh, emotion uh, at the level of the fusiform. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, th it's less visible because, in fact, the peak is quite preeminent, but this, this modulation here uh, it's, is significant when you do a mean uh, amplitude measurement. And now the thing is, uh, you know, with respect to what Denis was saying, is because uh, the reviewers of, of this paper, in fact, they ask us about the more neighboring region of the amygdala, you know, is it really amygdala activities that we are reconstructing? And to tell you the truth, when I, I, I said, okay, so we have to, to look at the regions nearby, and I was a bit worried myself to think, whoops, uh, what's going to come out? And in fact, I was quite surprised by the result, because you see, we took this region, because if you think about it, it's a region that is just in between the sensors and the amygdala, so you, the, the, where you would expect uh, contamination, and, and there is basically a no, no response, no effect whatsoever. For the hippocampus, okay, if you take the head of the hippocampus, you can't distinguish with the amygdala, you know, head of the hippocampus, the amygdala is just like above it, so uh, you have no result. But if you take the body of the hippocampus, then you see this. And, uh, and they are, there, there is some remaining effect, but it is, it's really um, uh, less strong and, and it's I, I, in fact, I was myself <coughs> quite uh, surprised to find it as convincing as that when I saw the results. But it would be possible with the range of causality modification to, to look oh at yes. if amygdala is the one that's... Yes, 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 definitely, yes. This yeah. is an experiment where we could... Uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, okay, that's it. <laughs> the next. We had to, to make a choice, uh, in fact, when we did the, the, the grandeur causality and we wanted to also validate the CTPS method. And so in the first place, I thought, okay, with uh, you know, the, the design with orienting, it's nice because we have the retinotopy, so we have the contralateral activations that are expected. 
So um, to, to test and validate the methods, it was nice to use this. It's simple, uh, simple checkerboard, so it, it's nice. But uh, it's true that, yes, uh, it would be interesting in this design. Mm -hmm. to Just I'm trying to, because now both your talks have kind of like pushed for like the misalized measure walk, right? Yep. Um, That's it. But, um, <laughs> but of course, you, you, I guess you, you've met a lot of skepticism. Yeah. Um, and I also find it a bit hard to, uh, because I see this as, as at least, it's very convincing source reconstruction on the level of the amygdala. But localizing activity, saying like it's coming from the amygdala. That that point can only be made when you contrast it with other areas, or, or right? You, you see mm. So, but but because yeah, this this having control regions is definitely one way of mm. saying like mm. uh, this provides some evidence that it is the amygdala. But but I agree with you. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. In fact, there are several points because me myself in the first place, you know, I was um, I was worried because when you publish a paper like that, it's like you. You, you go to methodologists, you say, okay, c please, can you, uh, you have to tell me, to explain to me and make sure, tell me if it's valid, if ca I, how much I can be sure that it is the amygdala. And honestly, nobody can <laughs> answer really that. They say, oh, well, you know, mathematically, we can give you the pros and cons and et cetera, et cetera. But after that, you know, they can't really answer. And uh, the point is, there are several things. First, uh, we, something that, to be honest, I think is not done in most paper, but I asked the, the Thibault to do it. He did a thorough uh, synthesis of the, of the histology of the amygdala. The basolateral nucleus, which is the biggest nucleus of the amygdala, contains 90% of pyramidal cells. First thing. Second, of course, these cells are not organized in layer and in parallel, but they are like at least six times denser than in the cortex. This is what he mentioned. So it's yeah. far away, but if some things goes out, you know, you will detect it because if anything, it's much stronger that comes from what comes from the cortex. And now what I reason, I also discussed with uh, Dominic as a neuroanatomist who is very specialized and, and he confirmed to us that, uh, okay, yes, it's in pyramidal cells and it could work and etc. And now the point is, I think, okay, if you, uh, if you stimulate the entire structure, maybe the sum, the net sum, will be zero. But at any point in time, when you send a stimulus like a gaze movement, a facial expression, you stimulate a subpopulation of cells that are like, you know, that are likely to have some organization. And I, you, the only thing you have to have so that this activity is detectable is that the net sum of the current produced is non-zero. There is no special reason why. Uh, you should be pessimistic to the point you think this sum should be zero. I'm quite sure that the, 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 the net activity is non-zero and then it gives rise to a current. And it's funny because nowadays, you know, there are like, uh, I think there is 10 or 12 pap papers that have been uh, published uh, with different methods, beamformer, uh, whatever, MNE, uh, weighted minimum norm, whatever. And they have localized uh, amygdala and in this paper, okay, we did both the review of the literature, which me convinced me in a way. And second, uh, we did this analysis, uh, which is in the supplementary data in the, of the paper, following the reviewer request. And we just, I mean, it, it showed dissociation. We have less effects. So in a sense, we were even uh, happier. I would say, you know, we have a design that from many fMRI studies, if you, we know there is activity in the amygdala. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, We've done the best to have activity elicited there. And I think since we reconstruct it there, I agree with you, it's not a definitive answer because the, it will be hard. The only thing we, well, the next stage and which I would like to do is of course uh, having some epileptic patient, amygdala implanted and be able to have uh, the All two like recorded patients. together. Ah, this is something we did in EEG mm. uh, because yes, I thought it would be great. Uh, especially because it's central, so I was hoping it would not disturb too much of the distribution. And you see a wonderful N1, it was in the design with just simply the gaze moving. We see a wonderful N170, so that means uh, well, the lack of the, I mean, uni exactly, unilateral lesion following a resection of the, and it's not just the amygdala, you know, it's resection for uh, unilateral uh, medial temporal lobe uh, epilepsy. 
So the, the resection uh, is not only the amygdala, you, it, can be, uh, it can go further uh, in the temporal lobe. Um, and the gaze effect is completely changed. It's not, at the time, it's not in the early time window, but the gaze effect in the later time window, which is the time window where we observed, in fact, a gaze effect here, is totally, uh, the, the topography is completely uh, uh, changed and the effect is, uh, disappears. So the effect is not there, okay. Yeah. So, but... Well, it me a little bit. <laughs> 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 no, it would be great 